Okay, I can start. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bing Shen. Uh, previous uh, talk addressed me as a crypto analyst or code breaker, but uh, this talk is not about it. It's about how to build a secure uh, e-voting system. In particular, we, we are interested in uh, unconditionally integrity for the end-to-end -end verifiable e-voting system. Uh, as you know, uh, Estonia has been using e-voting systems since 2006, and uh, maybe uh, many Baltic countries uh, uh, want to they want to introduce e-voting system. So, what is e-voting system? An e-voting system, the term e-voting, encompasses a broad range of voting systems that can apply the electronic element in one or more steps of the election process. For example, you have a ballot optical scan, you have a digital counting, all these are counted as e-voting systems. And um, they can mainly be divided into two categories. One is the on-site voting system. For this system, the voters still need to physically present into the voting booth and cast their vote on-site. And the second category is remote e-voting systems. For these systems, the voters can actually cast their vote online through the internet remotely. So they are also called internet voting or i-voting. Especially in Estonia, it's called i-voting. And there are many objectives for an e-voting system. In particular, I list three. The first one is to make the election process more efficient. For example, in Greece, usually the national election is just one day because it's too costly to maintain it for seven days or longer. And, but for e-voting, usually if the server is just running, keep it for one day or seven days, it's almost the same. It's a marginal increase of the cost. And the second is reduce the financial cost of the election. Uh, third is increase the participation of the social groups facing considerable physical barriers. For example, maybe there's a, a village covered by snow cannot come to the voting site. So e-voting will help in this case. Uh, entities in the e-voting system. First, humans, the voters. Second, the voters using their computer to vote, and thus these computers are called vote clients in our terminology. And the third, election authority or election authorities. They are responsible to prepare the election and announce the tally result. And here also we include the hardware they are controlled, like the ser ser servers, etc. And uh, the, uh, the, the most importantly, we assume there exists a publicly accessible bulletin board that the election result can be announced and the voter can come to gather the information and verify the election procedure. Okay, and uh, there are many properties an e-voting system need to have or desire to have, and I list a few of them. First one is eligibility. Only eligible voters are allowed to vote. Verifiability. The integrity of the election procedure can be verified by the voters or third party, external third party auditors. Fairness, there's no partial result can be known before the end of the election procedure. For example, you might want to manipulate the election. Privacy, no one should be able to know how a particular voter is voted. Receipt freeness, the voters cannot prove how they voted, so they cannot sell the votes to the others. And the coercion resistant, coercion resistance means no one can coerce the voters to vote in a certain way. Basically, they can put a gun on your head, say, please vote for this one. But you can have a way to, to go get around with it. In particular, in this talk, for verifiability, we mean end-to-end -end verifiability. In an end-to-end -end verifiability uh, e-voting system, the voters will obtain a receipt after the voting phase, and the receipt allow her to verify her vote was cast as intended, recorded as cast, tallied as recorded. 
So why it's end to end? At one end is the vote you intended in your mind. At the other end is the tally result. We can ensure that the tally result contains the vote you intended in your mind. So it's a very powerful notion that's called end to end verifiability. Um, the well known e voting systems are, for example, for on site voting, you have a sure vote, better vote desk, integrity, uh, star vote. And for remote e voting systems, you have famous like Helios and Skydo, also known as Norwegian voting system, Civitas, and Remote Integrity. Uh, I didn't put the uh, Estonian voting system there because it's not end to end verifiable yet. Um, until uh, our previous work, the end-to-end -end verifiability can be only achieved if the voters are supposed to trust, the, for example, the client environment, like the Skydo. Uh, but as we know, since the client is just a general purpose PC, it might have trojan, have malware, maybe compromise. So it's not secure to trust the client. But all the voters may trust some unfalsifiable assumptions, like a random oracle assumption. You assume the hash will produce random numbers, uh, such as the security of the helis is based on random oracle assumptions. Or some, uh, some, in some e-voting systems, the voters are supposed to trust randomness beacon. For example, NIST have randomness beacons. They are just the servers will periodic periodically output some random strings. But after the instance of uh, Edward Schnorden, we know that NIST may be manipulating their beacons. So it's not so trustworthy. So the fundamental question to ask is, can you prove that the election result is correct without requiring the voters to believe in the trusted hardware's unfalsifiable assumptions or random beacons? or even computational assumptions. For example, in the last two talk, we have a takeaway. Information theoretical assumptions are very bad, are very good. Computational assumptions usually will be broken, something like that. So we answer all this question affirmatively by presenting a system called the DEMOS, DEMOS voting system. Um, before we talk about the system, let's talk about the adversarial settings. What do we mean by security? For example, for privacy, it's a simulation-based privacy. You don't need to know what is it. Usually, it's a comparison between the real world and ideal world. In the real world, you have a bulletin board, you have an election authority, EA, a bunch of trustees, the voters, and their clients. So we assume the adversary is allowed to corrupt all but one trustees. Uh, proportion, uh, actually, more than majority of the voters can be allowed to craft a proportion of the voters and can monitor the traffic between the voting client and the server and can obtain the receipt and the stay of the voters. Okay, and in the ideal world, there's only a trusted third party who directly talk to the voter. And again, we have trustees and voters and uh, the adversaries are allowed to craft all but one trustees and a certain proportion of the voters. Okay, we say an e-voting system is a k-private if for any PPT adversary A in the real world, corrupting up to k voters, up to t minus one trustees, there is an adversary S in the ideal world, such that for all environment, the ideal experiment is indistinguishable from the real experiment. And for verifiability, we can do even stronger. That's the, actually the, the topic. We do unconditional verifiability. So the adversary is allowed to corrupt all the trustees, the election authority, a proportion of the voters, and all the voters' voting clients. So, but yet we still want to require the election can be verified. So we say an e-voting system achieves E2E verifiability with the parameter epsilon theta d if for any PPT adversary A, actually not PPT, for any adversary A that corrupts all but uh, theta voters cannot cause tally deviation more than d 
with more than epsilon probability. The key point is we can express the probability epsilon as a function of d or theta, and it should be the case that the epsilon decreases rapidly when d or theta grows very large. Building blocks. Uh, first one, we need a perfectly binding commitment scheme. What is a commitment? It's just a, a digital envelope. You can put a document in, and later you can open it and take it out. That's it. We say the commitment is binding. If you put the document in, and later you take it out, it's better to be the same document. You cannot change the document, then it's binding. We say the commitment is hiding if by looking at the envelope, it's very hard for you to find the content inside. So if you get no clue about content inside, then it's hiding. In particular, we want something called additively homomorphic property. What is it? For example, you commit three and five into the two commitments, and you put them to the addition box. The addition box will do some cryptography magic and compress the envelope and output one. When you open this one, you will get the sum of the three and five, which is eight here. So that's called additively homomorphic property. And in this case, in our case, we want to use the commitment to commit the candidate encodings. For example, for the i's candidate, we encode it as n to the i minus 1, where n is the total number of voters plus 1. For example, we have 9 voters, so n equal to 10. We have three candidates, Alice, Bob, Carol. According to our formula, the encodings are 1, 10, and 100. Let's say we got three votes, uh, one for Alice, two for Carol. This is their encodings. This is the envelope. We take them and put it into the addition box, and it will output one envelope. When we open it, it's the sum of all the numbers, which is 201. Now let's do the tally. Each digit of this number represents the vote of each candidate. For example, the first digit is two, that means we got two votes for Carol. The second digit is zero, which means we got zero vote for Bob. The third digit is one, which means we get one vote for Alice. Okay, that's the basic system. The second building block is so-called sigma protocols. We need to use it to prove our envelope is correct. In a sigma protocols, usually you have some statement. For example, I'm Alice, or I am more than 18 years old. And uh, the prover will first give some uh, what we call initial data, give some message, and the verifier will challenge the proof, give some random coin. And then in the third step, the prover will give some message, which we call final message. By take this transcript, everybody can verify the proof and output approved or reject, make a decision. Um, we say the proof is zero, zero knowledge if there exists a simulator that does not access to the secret information, but yet it can produce similar transcripts. Why is zero knowledge? Because if you can produce a similar transcript without the knowledge, then this transcript must contain zero knowledge about the secret. Okay, in our case, we want to prove inside the envelope is indeed a correct candidate encoding, which is n to the i. System description. The first step, setup. In the setup phase, the EA will produce a bunch of the ballots. For example, each ballot here have two sides, A or B. Each side have a serial number, SN100, and we have a vote code for each candidate. Here, in this example, it's just a yes or no. We have two vote codes. They are randomly generated vote codes. Meanwhile, EA also produces something to the BB. This is a table and indexed by the serial number. Again, for each ballot, we have two sides, functionally equivalent to two sides. Um, the EA actually put the encrypted vote code on this column and put the corresponding in candidate encoding commitments there and it's certified by the initial data, which is the beginning of the proof. Okay, during the voting phase, the voter will randomly select one side to vote. 
and the other side to audit. Assume he select B and he want to vote for yes. He simply submit the vote code for yes to the EA. And the receipt he get is the submitted vote code and the other unused side. After the voting phase, the EA should uh, finalize the election. First, he will decrypt all the vote code he put on the bulletin board before it was encrypted. Now it's decrypted. Okay, once you decrypt it, you can see, ah, this vote code has been voted. So he will mark all the voted um, vote codes as the term voted. And he will open the other side, unused uh, commitment to let you see, I did not uh, cheat. Because this side you did not uh, use, so I can open it to you without violating the privacy because you did not use it. And for those voted part, I will complete the Sigma protocols to prove inside the envelope is indeed a correct candidate encoding by complete by produce the final data. Tally is very simple. You just collect those envelopes which marked as voted. You add, put it into the addition box, produce the the envelope and give them to the trustee, the trustee will open it and give you the tally. Audit is optional, but uh, you can use the receipt you got from the step two. Check first your voted vote code is indeed marked as voted on the bulletin board. Second, the unused side matches the opened unused side on the bulletin board. Third, which is all the Sigma protocols must be verified, okay? But uh, this step is missing. Recall that in the Sigma protocols, the second step needs some verify to give you some random coin. But I did not tell you where do we get it. Uh, but if you look back to our setting, someone is still remain honest. If you look carefully, someone still capable of producing trustworthy coins. Uh, these honest voters, they are humans, okay? In fact, they already did. Recall that in step two, they randomly select one side to use, another side to audit. In this process, they produced one coin. Let's say side A is zero, side B is one. So each voter will give me one coin. And we can use that coins to produce the challenges and uh, recall the big picture, at the first step, the EA will put the first move of the Sigma protocols, then the voter will come to make their votes, and we can produce some challenges, and we can challenge the EA, then the EA will finish the proof by produce the final date. Of course, we can, we can compress the voter's coin by using hashes, if it's a collision resistant, but in that case, then we cannot get information theoretical security anymore. That will be computational assumption. Uh, for implementation, uh, the perfectly binding commitment is done via so-called algorithm uh, over instantiated over elliptic curve. Or oh, here I want to say that even quantum computer exists. This thing only broken for privacy. Does not broken for binding. Binding is perfectly binding. It's uh, it's by the mathematical property of this object. Uh, and the secret sharing scheme, this is information theoretical skew, uh, secure. Main feature is no client-side crypto, and we have some uh, localization via get tags. Uh, it's implemented with uh, Django and uh, Bootstrap, and we use the micro library and the Stanford JavaScript crypto library. Some screenshots, I will skip it. Um, from Later on, I will point you some some website for more information. Performance for small elections, let's say 1,000 ballots, you can prepare it within 21 seconds. For 10,000 ballots, you need about 3.5 uh, minutes. But if you want national-wise, you need more computers. This is just one computer. Uh, the system is tested in Greece. Uh, in the exit polls of 2014 Greek European Parliament election and in the exit polls of 2015 Greek national elections. Uh, that's the general one. Uh, Greece uh, tend to have national elections quite often. Not this one. January, January the 25th. 
Okay. Uh, these are the age profiles. Okay. With that, I will conclude my talk and uh, please go to 3w.demosvoting.org uh, for more information about uh, this system. And uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can ask one question. Considering all this, do you think it's safe, <laughs> e-voting? Um, depending on what do you mean by safe, uh, there are two way, two things I mainly uh, talk about. One is the privacy, one is the verifiability. Well, in some nations, they think verifiability is more important. Basically, they are preventing the government to cheat. They want unconditionally verifiability, which is this talk. In some nations, they think privacy is very important. Maybe the authority can manipulate it, but it's a, it's a trade-off. You cannot have unconditional everything. You can have information theoretic privacy or information theoretic, uh, let's say, secure verifiability, depending on what do you want. Uh, for SAFE, I think, uh, depending on your threat model, currently e-voting are pretty mature. Many countries are, are deploying them, although the Norwegian e-voting stopped, but it's not uh, the technical reason. I think it's uh, the political reason. Uh, well, you, you, have, you have two questions. The one is how to sell vote, one is how to not make your father to force you. How to prevent from selling vote is the point, so-called receipt freeness. It's the point that you cannot prove how you voted. For example, you take the, the code, you say, I voted for yes, you need to give me money, 50 euros, because I voted for yes. You see the vote code on the bulletin board, and it's mine. But uh, he, they will ask you why this vote code is for yes. Maybe it's for no. Then you say, this is my ballot. It's a yes. Yeah, you see. But you can change your ballot, right? So you cannot really prove, because I can print 1,000 ballots and sell it to everyone in different version. When, uh, for this guy, I said, yes, I voted for you. Thank you. Yeah, I voted for you. Thank you. You look, look. I voted for you because it's just a, a vote code, not a, not as a candidate. For the yes. But Yeah, yeah, but the um, th th this is known as a coercion because you have a screen and uh, I want to know how you voted. You, I, I have a monitor for CCTV. If you click for no, I will fire you. You have to click for yes. I monitor you, right? Uh, this actually can be achieved here. Uh, there are two ways to answer your question. One is, well, for this topic, uh, we always assume there is a certain moment the coercer is not with you. Because if from the day zero the coercer is with you, then uh, you are screwed anyway. Because uh, you are the coercer. The coercer can get your ballot, can tick you out. No, 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 you don't need to vote. Let me vote for you. you your opinion is not important. Okay. so. You, you have some moment, you are alone, okay? Then what you can do, number one, is you can switch uh, the correspondence in your ballot because it's just A4 ballot, you print it yourself. You switch, then in the camera, you see, this is a no, huh? I vote for no. Actually, the code is for yes, you know in your mind because you switched it, but you show it to the camera. This is a no, I vote for no. Then uh, he's happy. Right? The second one is you can gather so-called fake ballots. You can gather as much as you want. This is designed to protect coercion. You can get a lot of ballots. Usually coercer is not that stupid ask you to vote in front of the camera. They will just ask your ballot. They say, give me your ballot. Your opinion is not important. I will vote for you. 
then he take your ballot, go home and vote, right? This is the real coercion. But to prevent this, you have to go to the election authority beforehand to get as many fake ballots as possible. You can get a lot. These are fake. Inside the envelope, it's empty. But uh, well, on the digitally, the adversary don't know. Digitally, it's empty. On the bulletin board, if it, you put it into the addition box, it does not change anything. But you have this ballot, you can give it to them. Uh, someone comes, ha, ah, yes, yes, this is my ballot. Another guy comes, yes, this is my ballot. You can do that, okay? Yes. I can also suggest, uh, for example, uh, to leave possibility to change your vote. So you demonstrate that I voted for this guy, then I go home and I change my mind. Uh. Uh, to change the vote, uh, in this particular system, uh, you have to recast using another ballot. Because the vote code has been used, you can do it, yes? In this particular system, you have to take another ballot, cancel this ballot. Yes, you can do it. But uh, usually, uh, it's much easier for, um, well, for the second system, which I did not talk about, which is in this year CCS, which is a top security conference. Uh, you can do it uh, by that system. If you are encrypting your votes at home, then it doesn't matter, you can re-vote because you can encrypt it again and again. Let's say in Estonia, some, some crazy lady encrypted more than 500 times. So you can vote again and again, yes. Uh, it's actually a paper, but there are also a QR code on it allow you to put in, uh, let's say this ballot. It's a paper, you have a list, uh, you have two sides, actually you can have two papers. Uh, a QR is because we have an iPad or something, have a camera. When you put it in, it helps you. It loads the ballot, so everything now is on the client. So you can actually click a button and do some, something fancy. Uh, otherwise, you can just take the code and uh, you can use a phone because no client-side crypto. You can call them, say, I want to vote this number. And you can delegate to someone, for example, a grandma will ask her, his son, her son, say, I want to vote for this number, can you go on site to vote for this number for me? Uh, but uh, in, in general, it's just a printed paper with site and with options, vote codes, and uh, some serial numbers. But actually, it has more, I hide it here. It has a so-called receipt stuff, but uh, I will not talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, you enter the code. You, you also authenticate uh, during the voting. You just enter. If you get the actual ballot, then anyone can, who gets it can vote for you. That's true. Who gets the ballot can vote for you. But that's uh, true for every system. Who gets your ballot can vote for you. Okay, yes. If you're present in the voting uh, place and somebody checks your passport, then um, you uh, this one, actually, during our experiment, we do uh, do on-site voting because both are uh, exit polls. We go on-site. Basically, you go to the room. We check your ID. There's a box of uh, ballots. You randomly pick one and go inside to vote, and that's it. Uh, it's much more interesting to do it uh, if you can do it from home, but this again brings all those questions about how to control your... Uh, uh, home, usually, you can send them uh, by email or something, but uh, of course, you need to assume authenticated channel. For example, in Norway, they assume the post service is secure. You send them via post service. But uh, because your question was about the enrollment, Right? Who is eligible to vote? You want to check the ID. That's why it's on-site is better. 
On the other hand, if you have a registered address, I will, e I will send you, I will post to you your ballot. Uh, in some countries, it's considered to be secure and reliable. Yes, in some countries, they send credit cards over the mail and codes for internet bank. <laughs> yes, no, no, they do. I don't like it, yes, but they do sometimes if you ask them. But uh, maybe we can go for a break. And then there was one more question. But to actually experience and observation more. Yes. Yes. I use this voting, e voting two times now. The first one is uh, the first slide you had is the reason to have e, e voting is not for elderly people or but more than IT people. Uh, young people who are lazy to go to vote. In Estonia, I, I believe two, twice, two times we've done it, it was 16,000 and 64,000 participants. So the e vote has increased dramatically. And we use a pin nodes and ID cards, so you have to identify yourself in voting. We don't have this kind of bullets and papers. Yes. Thank you. Yes, but we should we should beware. Uh, last uh, Friday, I invited to Latvia one very interesting speaker to one conference. He was uh, he's young global leader and technology pioneer of World Economic Forum and managed and founded some IT companies. And he helped uh, Zimbabwe to fight election fraud by President Mugabe. And the thing that they did the fraud was in the last step. So it was fairly counted in the districts, yes, and they even published the results. But then the fraud happened when they put together the results from the districts and published final results. So they managed to get information from all the districts by camera phones, taking photos and sending to some central place where it was fairly counted. And so they announced the alternative true results. <laughs> but I hope it's not happening in Europe. Well, it, it's known right. as the fairness. You cannot get a partial result beforehand. But sometimes they can get it anyway through the media, through the exit poll. As, at least in, in, in Greece, the media will, will announce something in the middle of the election. They go to the exit poll to ask you how you voted, how you voted, how you voted. Actually, they can pretty accurate est estimate the proportion of the votes before the end of the election. But yes. anyway. I, I worked for some time in a payments uh, area, and there is such thing as electronic purse. And what is an electronic purse? So credit card is not an electronic purse because the data are stored somewhere really on the server, yes? But electronic purse is that you have the money in your pocket, and when you lose it, then it's gone. There is no way. Uh, in Bitcoin, they have electronic In Bitcoin, purse. the same, yes. So it's important to avoid this electronic purse principle in electronic voting so that all ballots are in one place and then you lose them or somebody tampers with them and then it's, uh, yes, compromised or lost completely. Yeah, yeah. But uh, f for Bitcoin, uh, do not use that so-called brain wallet or, or this purse because the human are very bad random number generators. Those uh, coins are, are broken immediately if, if you, you generate a random coin yourself. Uh, here also, uh, for one person, it won't work because humans are very bad at random number generating. You only need, uh, let's say, hundreds or, or at least a few, um, at least, let's say, 60 or 80 people then you can get uh, enough entropy that will make you secure. Yes, thank you a lot. So let's go for a break. Maybe we will start a few minutes later than scheduled because we had a very interesting discussion, but coffee and snacks are waiting for us outside.